In recent weeks, there has been an escalation of tension between the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, its alleged renegade province across the Taiwan Straits. Taiwan has traditionally been a nominal ally of the United States, but the U.S. policymakers have long been ambiguous about their relationship with Taiwan. At a time when the stakes for the U.S. and the Taiwan Straits are as great as they've ever been, we need clarity. So welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. My name is Ben Bayer. I'm a fellow and instructor at the Institute. And with me today is Scott McDonald, a PhD candidate in international security studies, political systems and theories at the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University in Boston, which is one of the top international diplomacy programs in the United States. And we wanted to bring uh, Scott on today because of his extensive expertise and background on the subject of Taiwan PRC relations, uh, and to talk about this geopolitical question uh, from a philosophical perspective. So uh, welcome, Scott. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. So before we get started and before we delve into uh, the substance of this topic, I thought I, want, I wanted to give you a chance to share some of your background on this subject. Uh, why do you know so much about it and, uh, and what your current work uh, involved on this topic is? Sure. Um, well, first of all, although I am retired, uh, retired from the United States Marine Corps, I maintain an affiliation with the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, which is a Department of Defense organization. So I think I should note that any opinions I express today are wholly my own and should not be interpreted as representing the position of the Department of Defense or the United States government. Uh, that being said, uh, two years ago, I retired from the United States Marine Corps after 24 years. About 24, 20 years ago, uh, the Marine Corps decided I'd be good at Chinese. So they taught me the language and made me a foreign area officer, which is basically the military version of a Sinologist or a China hand. And I spent a good part of the rest of my career um, looking at U.S. national security in the Indo-Pacific more broadly, but specifically as it related to the People's Republic of China. Uh, this included three years working at the American Institute in Taiwan, which is the uh, representational organization that the United States maintains in Taiwan in lieu of an embassy, since we do not have diplomatic relations with the government there. Um, uh, I subsequently retired from the Marine Corps and I'm now pursuing a PhD in international relations, as Ben said, uh, focusing on People's Republic of China. Uh, my research in particular looks at uh, classical Chinese philosophy and how this informs the thought system of the leaders in Beijing today and therefore how that influences foreign policy. And then one of the things that you just mentioned that I think is very interesting that we're going to come back to today is how you were a kind of diplomatic representative in Taiwan, even though we don't have official uh, diplomatic relations with Taiwan. And that's, that's an example of the kind of ambiguity that I was talking about at the beginning. So we're going to have to explore why that's the case, what caused that to be. Um, but I wanted to start the conversation by uh, setting kind of the current context to let people know more about the, the status quo uh, in East Asia. And there's been a lot in the news lately about the tension between the PRC, the mainland China, and Taiwan, also called the Republic of China. Uh, in particular, the PRC has made a number of aggressive incursions into Taiwanese airspace. Uh, its leadership, uh, President Xi, has been uh, much more vocal about the need to reunify the country. Uh, is this the ordinary thing to expect in PRC-Taiwan relations, uh, or has it become uh, more intense recently? Is this something to be more concerned about? What's your take on the current state of things in the Taiwan Stra Straits? Well, well, of course, uh, we wouldn't all be talking about it if it wasn't if it was completely normal, right? Uh, but there's a lot of normality in there. Um, first of all, let, let me uh, get a few words on the table here, right? You said reunifying. Uh, Taiwan will point out that the People's Republic of China has never, for not a single day, controlled the territory of Taiwan. So it would not be reunification; it would be unification. And uh, words become very important in the relationships as we deal with them here. Um, you also mentioned that these uh, flights have been incursions into Taiwan's territorial airspace, which is not actually the case. They've been incursions into the air defense information zone, which is an area in which uh, governments set up if another uh, country's airplane flies into it, 
uh, they query it, they figure out who it is and potentially send fighters to intercept. Um, that's still a, a step up more so in uh, quantity than type because the PRC has been slowly increasing these over the past couple of years. Uh, however, over the past couple of weeks, they've increased it massively, which is why this is, is making uh, so much news. So I think why, right? Why now? Well, there, there seem to be a few reasons. Um, and some of these are actually reinforced by the idea that, by the fact that they've fallen off since this became a big issue, right? So there's a couple things going on here. Um, first of all, there is kind of a shift going on in the region in terms of the PRC's relative power, right? Uh, they basically changed the status quo in, in Hong Kong and the West said, yeah, okay, that's fine. And so now they're feeling a little stronger and that they have the ability to flex their muscles a little more. However, there's also some things going on at home within the People's Republic of China. Next year, uh, 2022, is when everybody expected, uh, according to the leadership um, succession plan that had been going on for uh, a couple decades, everyone expected that Xi Jinping would step down at the end of 2022. And that's now up in the air. Uh, his uh, abolishing of term limits, the fact, uh, more importantly, that at the last party Congress, there was not an heir apparent anointed, makes a lot of people think he's going to try to hold on to power. And while it seems pretty monolithic from the outside, on the inside, we know there are factions, there are people who are opposed to that, and he still needs to appear strong and consolidate power. So he needs to show people that he's large and in charge. There's also economic issues going on. The economic model uh, that has led to the massive growth within the PRC is coming to an end. Basically, where they were the workshop of the world, where foreign concerns, foreign capital, foreign intellectual property drove uh, the production of goods in factories in China. Raw materials were imported, finished goods were exported, and you know the China did quite well, making money on the margins there. Uh, but it, it hasn't moved up the value chain, but its cost of labor is going up, and that model is starting to fall apart. So there's economic slowdown. We've heard lots in the news lately about various, not that they're entirely new, but they're big, the housing bubbles. Um, there's uh, recent shortages in power and energy production. And there's a lot of concerns that, you know, maybe the economic success that was bolstering up the party's leadership is falling. And we need something to rally the troops. Uh, so there's that angle. There's a concern that Taiwan is continuing to drift away, right? Uh, a few years ago, there were a lot of people were talking about how time was on the mainland side. All they had to do was hold out and Taiwan would eventually be uh, absorbed back into the motherland. You spend much time in Taiwan, you'll see that place has changed. It's different. The people have different ideas about who they are and what they want to be. And it's not getting closer to the mainland, it's getting further away. And there's a concern that they have to be reminded that they can't go too far or uh, they, they will be reunited with force if necessary. So there's a, a combination of issues here uh, then coming together last week in October 1st, the uh, anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And so, hey, we got to do something, we got to look strong. And I think you had this confluence of events coming together. So that's, that's why tensions were at a height, uh, especially last week. The United States and other parties have been a little more willing to push back lately. So they have to demonstrate that they uh, are serious and are willing to push back. Of course, there's the domestic audience function. Uh, jingoism has, has been uh, flamed and then taken off on its own a little bit. And they, they're appealing to that domestic audience, reminding Taiwan. And then from a straight um, you know, tactical perspective, there's uh, a sense in which this is establishing a new status quo by the routine flight of aircraft in this area. It um, establishes a pattern whereby it becomes normal and it becomes harder to detect an actual attack because there are always these aircraft flying towards Taiwan and through its air defense information zone. So you mentioned a moment ago that the U.S. was pushing back a little bit more than usual against these kinds of incursions. Could you say more about uh, what form that's taken and then more generally what the Biden administration's stance toward uh, Taiwan versus the PRC has been? 
So one area that, that's not official, but not unimportant, is there's been a lot of discussion within the U.S. security community and within the Congress on whether or not the United States should extend a formal security guarantee to Taiwan. Um, the treaty that uh, the United States had with Taiwan was abrogated back in 1979, and we no longer have a defense relationship with Taiwan, uh, at that time with the Republic of China. And um, there's a lot of talk of whether or not it is time to do so. Uh, for one reason, the amb ambiguous situation you spoke about originally designed to ensure stability, some people fear is now leading to instability, and the question of will the U.S. come or not makes the PRC uh, more willing to be aggressive. So there are people actively talking about we need to extend a security guarantee. And Beijing is aware of this. They know that the United States Congress has long been much more pro-Taiwan than uh, the executive, and, and that concerns them. Um, some formal things that are happening is an increased willingness on the part of the United States, encouraged by Congress, but also uh, uh, fulfilled by the executive under a few presidents, is increasing high-level visits on Taiwan. Uh, for the last several decades, you have not seen cabinet-level officials on Taiwan. That has now happened uh, a few times recently, and there's, they're encouraging more. Um, the... Uh, the Congress is encouraging, and executive seems to be moving towards actual uh, ship visits on Taiwan. Hasn't happened yet, but the idea of a U.S. military ship sailing to Taiwan right now is uh, a big deal and would freak the PRC out. Um, and then just generally making statements that are more pro-Taiwan having a say in its own future, not saying independence, but you know being in favor of Taiwan, the fallout from COVID, and the PRC's uh, interference with information flow and preventing Taiwan from having a say uh, in pandemic response, uh, even while it was doing pretty well uh, and, and trying to raise the alarm before other people were. So this confluence of little things to the PRC looks dangerous. It's a trend. It's more people being more willing to take a stronger stance pro-Taiwan and the, the PRC wants to interfere with that trend. This is a, a developing situation. And, and this gets to their philosophy, right? And the heart of their ideas. And some of the things you draw out of Chinese philosophy, which metaphysically is this important idea of the potential in a situation and the way that it develops over time. And the situation, when you have more and more people leaning that direction, when you have more things kind of aligning towards a separate Taiwan, that's a trend that they do not want to see develop. So they have to figure out how to influence that situation to get it back on course. Well, let's talk a little more now about how we got to this point. Um, a few moments ago, you mentioned that uh, October 1st, I think, was the uh, anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. We're coming up here on another anniversary of some significance, which is the 50th anniversary of the expulsion of Taiwan uh, from the United Nations. That happened October 25th, 1971. Uh, and when that happened, uh, the PRC then took the seat at the Security Council that uh, the Republic of China had previously held. Can you, especially to give our audience some, some background historical context on today's affairs, can you tell us more about why that decision happened in 1971? Sure. Um, well, you know, first of all, you know, as, as Ayn Rand alluded to in, uh, in her articles uh, on the, the Shanghai gesture, not something we should have been surprised about uh, coming from the United Nations in many ways, right, uh, given what it is and, and who is in it. Um, but there are a number of factors within the way that the international diplomacy was done at the time that, that kind of came together for this. Um, first of all, you know, for diplomats, the, what is the actual situation on the ground? What's, what's the de facto situation matters? And point in fact, the government in Beijing was the PRC. And to a lot of people in the diplomatic community, that mattered, and therefore they should have a seat at the United Nations. This is an organization of states, uh, that they are a state, they should be here. But wait a second, isn't Taiwan? So, so then we come to how it gets more interesting, right? So. Of course, at this time, 
uh, people like uh, the People's Republic of China were, were campaigning, saying, hey, we are the rightful government. We're in Beijing. We should be here. And the United Nations is made up of many, many states, uh, including many from what at the time was called the non-aligned movement, and uh, which the PRC claimed to be part of and advocated within. And so straight up, they had the votes. The, in, from the United States perspective, while they opposed it, they didn't officially oppose it. They wanted the PRC to get a seat and Taiwan to keep a seat, is what the United States actually advocated for on the floor of the General Assembly. Um, and part of this was the de facto-ness. Part of it was flat out American pragmatism and instrumentalism, right? This is a tool. They're there. We want better relations. How do we build this? Yeah, let them in. But let's try to keep Taiwan there as well. So even though the, the U.S. was at least formally opposed to the expulsion of Taiwan uh, from the U.N., uh, when that decision was made against their opposition, it still seems like it had significant impact on U.S. bilateral relations with Taiwan and with China separately. Uh, it, was, it was only a few, it was only shortly after the U.N. expulsion that it, the U.S. reconfigured its whole relationship with, with Taiwan. And it, can, can you tell us more about how that was done? What was the change in relationship? Well, um, in fact, I, I think it was in the cards already. Nixon actually went to China in July. Uh, this happened in October, right? And Nixon was a pragmatist, right? He saw this primarily as pieces on a chessboard, uh, U.S. versus Soviet Russia. China's a piece I want. And if I have to give up the chess piece of Taiwan, I'll give it up because I want China. So I think this is, you know, Nixon was, was very, very much a pragmatist, and I think that's the way he saw it. Um, what happened over time is he, you know, he went to China, he, had, he made the statement about how uh, the United States would reduce its military over time, uh, but it didn't happen as fast as he actually uh, had intended until President Carter in uh, 1978 formally switched recognition technically on the, the 1st, January 1st, 1979, and said, we're now recognizing uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, he abrogated the, uh, he provided notice that the United States was abrogating the treaty, mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. And that happened over the course of a year. Forces were drawn out. Uh, and then, um, we're going to have some relations with Taiwan, right? Uh, we'll, we'll do something. And Congress pushed back pretty quickly, actually, and uh, passed in April of uh, 1979 the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, often referred to as the TRA. And this is U.S. domestic law, which governs our relationship with Taiwan. And that act uh, says that the United States will continue to maintain relationships with Taiwan uh, personal, cultural, economic. Uh, it establishes the American Institute in Taiwan as a uh, non-governmental organization responsible for carrying on these relationship programs with Taiwan. Um, so it kind of looks like, smells like, feels like a mid-sized U.S. embassy, except it's not. It um, And the Taiwan Relations Act, also, Relations Act also very importantly instructs the executive branch to provide Taiwan with the military equipment and training necessary in order to enable it to defend itself. And those are, those are kind of the, the key concepts of it right there. And from that point on, uh, in 1979, you know, the United States officially recognizes the People's Republic of China as the only legitimate government of China. It recognizes that the PRC and the government on Taiwan both agree that there is only one China, but disagree what that is. And the United States says, it's your job to figure that out. I mean, it's a strange kind of uh, double talk and double speak that our diplomats have with regard uh, to the nature of the system in Taiwan, uh, recognizing it, but not recognizing it. And uh, you, you referred a moment ago to the, the Ayn Rand article on 
Nixon's visit to China. We'll talk a little more about her view later, but one of the things that that uh, she mentions and she argues for is that this policy shift amounted to uh, an incredible betrayal of Taiwan, which had been a, a, a U.S. ally. Uh, you you said a few things about what you th- about what Nixon thought he would get from this kind of betrayal uh, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, and in effect, wanting to be in a position to play the PRC off against the Soviet Union. Looking back from the perspective of history, do you think that Nixon was on to anything there? Did he, in fact, get anything from that relationship? Did he get what he was expecting to? Thoughts on that question? I think ultimately the United States did not get what it thought it would get there. Um, the Well, it's certainly... You know, at the time, the, the PRC and, and Soviet Russia were on the falling out, but the PRC was not really in a, in a position to influence that greatly. Uh, the United States was more in a position to influence uh, the PRC's ability to withstand Soviet threats, uh, which the PRC certainly wanted because they were having issues on their northern border at the time. But I don't think it really helped the United States a whole lot, especially in the way that it was executed. Right. The um, Nixon basically swore off principles. Right. <laughs> and he's like, you know, uh, our position, what we think is important in the world isn't isn't important. All that's important is that we have this relationship and that we put these we balance the pieces on the chessboard. And so he's he sacrificed the idea of what we even were in the business of defending ourselves for and instead made it a trading game. And what did we trade with? Well, remember at the time, the PRC was in the midst of a cultural revolution uh, where they were flailing themselves for over uh, ideology. Uh, However, they maintained a rather principled stance and we said quite clearly that we did not have any. Um, I I think this is reflective of the fact that in, especially Nixon, but in the United States at the time, you know, it it wasn't even a principled Cold War anymore. It wasn't over ideology. I don't think he saw this as capitalism versus communism anymore. He saw it as the United States versus Soviet Russia, or Russia, as he saw it, and it was just pieces on a chessboard. And I think this speaks more to the the lack of principle in a lot of U.S. foreign policy. This idea of why are we doing this? What do we believe in and why are we doing it for? Um, and instead, it just becomes about moving pieces around on a chessboard. And so we traded away uh, our values for a piece that wasn't very strong. And in the long run, then, it got us tied to this brutal regime that we then saw cracking down on its own people a decade later. Uh, and we're like, uh, what do we do now? And the United States pulled away a little bit, as most people did, but then, you know, tried very quickly to mush it over. We found ourselves coddling uh, an oppressive regime and getting nothing out of it. And I don't think the United States ever got much out of that relationship. So if this is a chessboard to U.S. policymakers, then it, look, it looks like Taiwan is, is the pawn that gets sacrificed and you put it in terms of the sacrifice of values. Let's talk a little more about what values are being sacrificed in a move like this. Uh, what does the political system in Taiwan look like today? I know there's been a lot of development over the decades since 1949. Uh, What did Taiwan used to look like? What does it look like today? You also talked about how part of what the PRC was concerned about was the the way in which the people of Taiwan are moving further and further away from the PRC uh, culturally. What does that amount to, uh, both culturally and politically in Taiwan? Sure. Well, of course, Taiwan is much different today than it was even in Nixon's time, to be fair, right? Um, you know, when when the nationalists fled the mainland to Taiwan, you know, Chiang Kai-shek was kind of a brutal guy and a dictator and ended up suppressing uh, many people who already lived on Taiwan in order to keep things in control. And so it, he, he wasn't necessarily a great guy. And, you know, there's some history there about even the U.S. trying to think of how we shed this guy and what's a different solution for Taiwan um, in the early post-war period. 
whether or not the United States would take it over as a protectorate to get rid of Chiang Kai-shek or, or even support a coup. Uh, what do we do with this, this place? Um, however, uh, left to itself there, separated from the mainland, uh, it needed to do something <laughs> in order to survive. And ultimately, uh, they emphasized uh, economic growth. And then eventually, especially under uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, uh, Zhang Jingguo, um, liberalization of the political system. And so starting in 86, they threw the gates open and they said, no, if we're going to survive, we need to have a liberal representative system of some sort. And so progressively, uh, since then, starting with the first um, uh, popular vote presidential election in 96, uh, Taiwan has become an increasingly uh, liberal and, and representative system, a uh, very vibrant uh, representative system where the people get very involved and very excited about the vote. And they've now had um, multiple transitions of power from the Guomindang to the DPP, back to the Guomindang, and now to the DPP, uh, the DPP being the, uh, the main opposition party, or no, <laughs> the party in power now, but originally the opposition party to the, the Guomindang, which was the nationalist party of dictatorship, right? And is now another party um, vying for representation. So a very vibrant, free society uh, that has values that are, um, you know, as objectivists, we, we wouldn't say they were, you know, got it 100% right, but they're certainly much closer to uh, uh, a liberal system than to a, um, an authoritarian system and, and very proud of that and very proud of their ability to dissent. The other interesting change that has gone on is that in 1949, uh, there were about 6 million people living on the island, 1948-49, and 2 million Kuomintang came to the island from the mainland and took over. And they kind of squashed it and they said, no, we're Chinese. We are the Republic of China. And for many years, there was, there was a bit of a conflict on the island, actually, between the Taiwanese, who were largely ethnic Han Chinese, whose relatives had moved four to 500 years before, and the mainlanders, who were, once again, ethnic Han Chinese, but who had come over with the Guomindang. And a lot of animosity you know, fistfights in the street. Intermarriage was, was rare. Um, and there were Taiwanese and there were mainlanders. Well, over the course of the last couple of decades, and for all of Chen Shui-bian's flaws, and, and he had many, uh, under him, he really pushed this idea of, no, we are Taiwanese. We're different. And if, if you visit Taiwan today, that distinction between the mainlanders and Taiwanese is largely gone. Not completely. There's still places where it matters, but most places it doesn't. We're just Taiwanese. What does that mean? Someone who's from here, who grew up here, and who values the way my society lives and runs. And they have their own identity. And yes, they recognize that they're ethnic Chinese, but that's a lot less important than they're from here. And these are my values. And so while people on the mainland and for a long time, many mainlanders in Taiwan thought that we're all Chinese and eventually we're going to move back together. The people on that island no longer see themselves as rightly part of mainland China. By and large, they view themselves as unique and their own people. And though they can't act like it internationally, their own country. And so it's moving away. And I think leadership in Beijing has started to recognize that. For many years, I didn't think they did. Uh, you, they didn't understand that this place was no longer as Chinese as they thought it was. And th when they spoke of it, you could, you could tell in the way they talked about the, the Chinese who are on Taiwan who, and who have been misled by, by Chiang Kai-shek and his American running dogs. No, these people have their own opinions now and they're heading their own way. And that's why it's gonna be awfully hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again because it's different. And that's why time is not on Beijing's side. Short of any formal declaration of independence instigating a war, how, how realistic do you think the prospect of one actually is? Do you think that the, the mainland uh, government would ever uh, go that far if it was in enough of a crisis that it needed a distraction like that? Uh, clearly things have gotten uh, 
tensor recently. Do you foresee uh, a realistic possibility of a war anytime in the in the near term? The possibility is certainly there, but there's there's several different caveats within what you said there, right? So first of all, is either side trying to go to war tomorrow? No, right? Not not useful for either side uh, to have a war tomorrow. Um, if Taiwan declared independence tomorrow, would the leadership in Beijing feel pressured to go to war? I think yes, which is one of the reasons that even Tsai Ing-wen, the president of Taiwan, who used to be an ardent pro-independence person, doesn't utter, come close to uttering the word and promised not to, right? So that would start a war, which is why they don't say it. Um, my fear is that it is very easy to stumble into a war because it, as you have increasing number of Chinese, uh, mainland Chinese aircraft flying in close proximity, and you have, um, you know, Taiwan-based pilots who need to go up and defend their airspace, right? And they're, because there have been so many flights, they're mixing it up, some with uh, air defense assets, some with fighters, but this, this need to defend their air, airspace, uh, pilots flying in close proximity to one another increases the chance for miscalculation and mistakes. Uh, think of the EP3 incident back in 2001, where the uh, PRC pilot intercepting the P3 starts hot dogging it, proving how good a flyer he is, bumps into the P3, and now we have an international incident. If that happens with a Taiwan-based fighter jet, and somebody dies, especially if it's a mainland pilot, I think the leadership in Beijing is going to have a hard time um, not doing anything. Um, the other uh, potential clash that, that I fear uh, that this is setting up is if you look on a map and you look at where this surge in flights is currently taking place off the southwest coast, they basically take place between Taiwan proper and a, a, a little island feature called Pratus Reef. It's a little reef, uh, kind of circular, one of the islands is Pratus Island, and it's owned by Taiwan. It's actually closer to Hong Kong than it is to Taiwan. Um, and uh, by establishing this routine presence in that airspace, uh, the PRC makes it very easy to cut that off and to, if they feel they need to show they can do something, to fabricate a reason why they have to go in and save Pratus Island and thereby take it back just to prove they can do something. And once, once force gets involved, uh, you know, the chances of miscalculation just go up and up. And so th that's one way that I think the PRC might feel it has to do something. That's something they might try to do. What happens next uh, depends on the actions of many individuals. What kind of consequences are we talking about? What would be the effect on the world uh, of, of, a, of a conflict in the Taiwan Straits? Where uh, and, and here there are, you know, we can talk about the economic implications, the political con consequences. What are we looking at? Right. And the economic implications are the very first thing to pop to mind, right? Because the moment that there's a, um, a conflict in the Taiwan Strait, the uh, Lloyds of London jacks up insurance rates on shipping and uh, the price of everything you buy uh, ticks up and starts ticking up rapidly. Once those ships have to avoid the South China Sea, uh, the cost of every container ship coming uh, from the Indian Ocean to the West Coast of the United States goes up by $10,000, it's estimated, uh, as they have to avoid that route. So the prices of everything go up. Uh, that's before you start talking about the supply lines being disrupted. So in an interconnected world, uh, a war in that region quickly drives the price of everything up and disrupts supply, supply chains. Uh, politically, it, you've got the two biggest elephants on the block now tangling and uh, further economic, uh, it's going to uh, cause the markets to spike or to drop. And, but then it's going to influence the way that, that other powers relate to them and start lining up behind one or the other. And you'll notice a lot of states have tried very hard not to say how they would fall down in such a conflict. But once it starts happening, it's going to be harder for some of them to, to stay neutral. Uh, it's certainly going to affect our relationship with Japan, uh, probably tying this, uh, Japan tighter to us and probably bringing Japan into that. Uh, the, the question that some 
worry about is what effect does that have on other trouble zones, right? Now you have the U.S. and the People's Republic of China tangling in the Pacific. Does North Korea see this as, a, as an opportunity? Does Iran see this as an opportunity? And there's a lot of concern that you might see this naturally spread to a broader conflict, not because the PRC or the United States choose it to do so, but because other powers take advantage of it. So it's going to be a pretty nasty event uh, should it happen. So trying to plan for these contingencies depends on a lot of speculation about what the Chinese leadership would do. And you you mentioned earlier that uh, the role you had with the military was to be a kind of military China hand, someone who's trying to call the cards in effect. But when you're trying to make a prediction about the way someone is going to act, it helps to know something about the way they think. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on the show in particular, because you have put a lot of attention to this very topic by uh, doing a lot of work on understanding Chinese philosophy and the way Chinese philosophy influences Chinese policy. So uh, tell us more about that. Uh, You touched on it briefly once already, uh, but how does Chinese philosophy influence Uh, the Chinese government. Uh, They are known by everyone to be a a form of communist government, but uh, it's communism with, as they say, Chinese characteristics. Um, How does, what do we get with that blend of Chinese philosophy plus Western Marxism? Right. Um, Well, part of that Chinese characteristics uh, is that uh, communism is dead, uh, in case you didn't get the memo, Uh, and and has been for a while, right? But um, the the Communist Party attempted very hard to get rid of some of the old back in uh, the Cultural Revolution, right? tearing down Confucius temples, uh, uh, directly criticizing the moral system that, that was built on traditional Chinese ideas. But they failed. They drove some of it underground. But, you know, even Mao was brought up in the classics. And as the Cultural Revolution receded and life returned to normal in China, or normal-ish, fairly normal in some ways, the, the traditional ideas came back. And, you know, I saw this firsthand when I lived there and where my interaction with people on a daily basis was built on the ethical and political system that's founded on this traditional philosophy. Um, you could see it in the way that they looked at the world and the way they thought about ideas, and most importantly, in their, their concept of ethics. You now even see it in their concept of politics. The, the Chinese Communist Party... Uh, views society, the manner of ruling a society, and even structures itself in a very traditional way built along traditional philosophical lines. So looking at this and me being an international relations professional, I said, I need to understand this better. I need to dig into this philosophy and understand exactly what these ideas are, how they think, so that I can understand uh, what they might do from a foreign policy perspective. And so I went back into the canon and dug through it. Um, you know, your Confucius, uh, your Confucian texts, the classics, Taoism, and how these all fit together within the, the pantheon of traditional Chinese thought. And I uh, derived what I think are from these four key principles that, that drive foreign policy decision making. Uh, two of them metaphysical, uh, potential and emptiness. What is the world? Uh, I'll explain in a second. One of them epistemological names and one of them uh, ethical hierarchy. So I spoke briefly about potential earlier, moving to our epistemological point, the use of names, right? The fact that they they targeted Marriott hotels because Taiwan was listed as a country uh, on their website and then all the major US airlines. And then most recently, uh, a high school in Aurora, Colorado was kept out of participating in a UN event because they happened to some place on the school website, someone had suggested Taiwan was a country. Because the names are important. And if we get everybody talking about Taiwan only as a province, then that will become a fact. And it will cut Taiwan off from the rest of the world. This leads to where should Taiwan be? Within the moral hierarchy. And this extends to the whole region, right? If you look at traditional Chinese 
uh, organization from my family, your family, my village, your village, all the way up to the emperor on top. Well, the emperor sits not only on top of my country within the Chinese cosmology, but on top of all the countries. And all the relationships are hierarchical and reciprocal in there, but you act morally by acting in accordance with your appropriate place. So Taiwan to act appropriately is deferential to the PRC, as frankly, are Japan, Vietnam, everybody else. And so that's viewed not just as our power is better served if we are in charge, but it's also a moral question. People are behaving correctly when they understand our appropriate place in the hierarchy. And so if you look then at the larger PRC foreign policy with these four principles in mind, right? Situational potential, emptiness, names, and hierarchy. You can see that they're trying to order the international system to favor their position as the norm setter and standard bearer, which is the appropriate means of leadership in the classical Chinese tradition through managing the situation by uh, changing the way people think about things through names and blocking off the things that they think are theirs. And so that's why I think understanding the philosophy is important. And by, by going through this process and studying it, I think I can understand, for example, why those planes are flying, not just in Taiwan's eight is the, the air defense identification zone, but why they're flying off the Southwest corner and not the Northwest corner because it gives the PRC something else that they can use should they need to do something in the next few months before the uh, lack of a leadership transition in order to buttress Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping's power. So there's my a condensed version of what I'm working on here. <laughs> That's really interesting. And one of the things that it makes me think, the way that you've described the different kind of overall principles of the Chinese worldview is that it, it, to put it in terms that Ayn Rand, I think, would have described it uh, from the perspective of objectivist philosophy, it's a heavily socially metaphysical worldview where the ultimate reality to you is not the, uh, not nature and uh, mind independent world, but other people and that it's other people and what they think of you, what, the, what names they use, and their relationships to you, whether they're higher or lower, that is sort of the most important thing there is. And, and it, it does make sense, it seems, of a lot of the way they, they act uh, towards, uh, towards Taiwan. Now, I think Ayn Rand uh, would have, I mean, did uh, criticize this this metaphysical outlook as as the as the wrong one because it's not really other people who fundamentally define our lives. It's our own relationship to reality, and she regarded the this kind of social metaphysical outlook as uh, an expression of a kind of uh, insecurity and lack of self esteem. And if it's a outlook that continues to dominate Chinese thinking and politics. Uh, it, it would lead one lead one to speculate that there's a there's a lack of self esteem there as well. Uh, do you think that's a an accurate uh, assessment of 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 the of the state of things in the, in their thinking? Well, you know, it's very interesting the way you phrase that, right? Because um, you know, first of all, Ayn Rand, unsurprisingly, is right. Uh, the for for Confucius, the family is actually a metaphysical concept. Right. It's not social. It is a metaphysical fact that the family is the center of human society and it all grows out of that. Um, but uh, even before you got to your question there, you know, you mentioned that um, that they have that you don't have self-esteem uh, outside of the social contract. I forget the exact words you use, but it, it was great. But the um, m many people in that tradition would say, well, you get self-esteem from being part of the family. Right. And so there they are absolutely to the extent that you accept this tradition, basing your own worth on the value of the social construct. So then, well, if you're basing your own worth on the value of this society, right, obviously you're, you're not thinking about yourself and, 
and your own self-esteem. You are basing it on society. And now, you know, the narrative within the PRC is the century of humiliation, right? We were torn asunder by the powers of the world. It is the party's job to bring back uh, our, our worth by returning all these lost parts to China. And we will not be fully fulfilled until Taiwan is returned and we have achieved natural rejuvenation. So it's not only that there is not this sense of personal self-esteem, it's that, that, that self-esteem or that sense of worth comes from the society. And I'm telling you, we don't have it yet. And in order to have it, we must accomplish these things. And one of them is Taiwan has to come back which helps explain why this island that has never belonged to the PRC, that was hardly ever even administered by Imperial China, and then only because they felt they had to because there were pirates on it, why this island that's never been that important in Chinese history is now very important to the leadership in Beijing because they have made it one of the symbols of their self-worth rather than seeking it through individual self-esteem. And that bringing in Taiwan there is especially interesting because one thing that strikes me about the way you've described the development of Taiwanese culture is, I mean, they also lost a lot in, in, in the last century. I mean, they, they, they used to be the government of all of China, but then they were uh, relegated to a tiny island that nobody cared about. And yet, in spite of that loss, it seems like the people of Taiwan have moved forward and uh, have have developed a, a, a kind of self-esteem of their own, regardless of the fact that the rest of China uh, is against them, and regardless of the fact that they've lost so much, and they have uh, great achievements to show in spite of all that loss. And so it makes me wonder if part of what is threatening to the PRC about Taiwan is precisely that they have this self-esteem that the, the mainland China has not been able to acquire on its own. Thoughts on that? You have 23 million people trapped on this little island. How can you be proud of yourself, right? We have 5,000 years of Chinese civilizational history. That's pretty cool. Why, why do you feel okay over there by yourself not being part of that? Blows my mind, right? And in fairness, it, it was a transition period on Taiwan, right? This idea that we're not going back to the sense that, well, why would I go back? I'm going forward. Right. It, it took time because it was so ingrained in the psyche. But now, absolutely, people are proud to be Taiwanese. And that's that's different. And it's certainly once the PRC understands this, it's frightening to them. I absolutely agree. Yeah. So let's pivot back uh, at this point to the United States and its perspective on this whole issue. We've talked a bit about the philosophical differences between uh, China and Taiwan. Let's talk about the philosophic ideas that are now moving U.S. policy. Uh, you said a few times, uh, talked a few times about the pragmatism of the Nixon administration. Pragmatism is a, not just a way of describing a policy, but it's a philosophic outlook. Uh, would you say that that same philosophic outlook is governing U.S. foreign policy today? Is it? Uh, is it better? Is it worse? How would you characterize it? Well, at root, the, the governing philosophy in the United States is blank out, right? Uh, well, what is our philosophy? We don't have one of those. But more than anything, it's inconsistent. And uh, there certainly uh, continues to be a large strain of, of philosophical pragmatism. Um, and I, But I think uh, within our very large and diverse national security community, there's a mix between this uh, pragmatic outlook and the search for liberal values, right? Uh, the United States being the beacon of liberal values, um, the, the problem with that is what are liberal values often left undefined and to the extent that they are defined today, often skewing towards the human security strain, um, kind of, you know, driven by this uh, international community sense of doing what's right. Okay, what's right. And I think that comes from uh, both epistemologically, 
and then ultimately ethically from, from Kantianism. Uh, in the United States, often uh, transmitted through uh, Dewey <laughs> and the way that we, uh, we educate a lot of our, uh, our young to just be kind of bouncing off walls, pragmatist, uh, doing what has to be done. And then uh, for, so a lot of people who are within the national um, security community who are very much cold, realist, interest calculation, there, there's not a philosophical background to that because we just don't do that in the United States, right? Um, from the perspective of a lot of people. Those who do have uh, a more principled approach tend to be ethic, ethically Kantian and following the kind of your, the world community and what they end up valuing then is peace, right? They're seeking peace. They're seeking not war. They're seeking not harm. They're seeking the greater good. Unfortunately, <laughs> when, when that's as far as you get, right, and you do not actually take the time to define that further even, what you end up getting is just compromise. Because when you're just searching for this fuzzy goal defined in terms of some collective, you end up compromising values or principles for the sake of peace. And it ultimately becomes an altruistic foreign policy where you you give up whatever in order to to make things you know stable and peaceful and you end up seeding the the uh the intellectual field to those who have an idea and it tends to be not good right <laughs> when when the only people who are acting in an actual principled fashion are those such as the prc who are attempting to change things uh they, they tend to win that ideological debate, as you saw in 1971, when right, the Shanghai community and, and the communique and, and, and Ayn Rand gets to this in her article, the, the PRC took a very principled stance and the United States half of the communique was, well, you know, we'll work together. They, they sacrificed principle to compromise. Let's let's talk about that uh, Ayn Rand article now. There were two parts of it that I wanted to share with our audience and discuss with you. And the first part is her commentary on what values are at stake in this relationship and, and, and the values that she thinks are being sacrificed when Nixon first goes to China and starts to pivot to the PRC. This is written, uh, I think, uh, and it's written shortly after the, U the Taiwan is expelled from the UN. So here is uh, the first half of the first part I want to show. She writes, The Republic of China on Taiwan is a mixed economy like the rest of the semi-free world, but it is free enough to have become, in the past 20 years, one of the world's outstanding examples of economic progress and prosperity. Think of how hard and how courageously those two million Chinese refugees had to work for such an achievement are we, the United States of America, the country that had proudly stood as an asylum for victims of tyranny, are we to betray men of that caliber and deliver them into the hands of their executioners? If we are, then what sort of obscene mockery? Let me get to the next paragraph. If we are, what sort of obscene mockery is our foreign aid program? What is the purpose of all the billions poured into the undeveloped countries under the pious slogan of helping them to help themselves? Here is a country, the Republic of China, that took us at our word and our honor, that struggled and worked and rose to stand on its own feet as a beacon of civilization on the end of an enormous continent swallowed by primordial brutality. If we desert Taiwan, then what are we doing in the rest of the world? Or are we helping to fatten victims for the slaughter? We'll talk a moment what she thinks the implications of this are. But before we get to that, do you have any thoughts on this kind of overall general characterization of uh, uh, the value in the Taiwan-U.S. relationship that she's talking about. So um, I see the value in Taiwan in that regard, right? Here is a, a country that was pulling itself up by its bootstraps. By, by no means was it perfect, right? The political system had some, some serious issues at the time, but they were certainly striving to be more American in several ways, striving to be better for themselves at the time. And uh, they now our relationship with them uh, from a security point of view, in, in some ways, I think this this hampered it a little bit was tied to containment, right? 
containment for containment's sake, rather than a, a principle of defense of what is good here. And because our policy was based on kind of a flawed concept of our standing vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Russia, it made us easier to discard a country like this that was actually in some ways fulfilling our values. But we weren't looking at them in terms of those values. We were looking at them in terms of one more outpost against Soviet Russia, right? We weren't looking at them for what they actually were and what they were actually valuable in terms of. Uh, so I think even by not seeing the world through uh, a proper philosophic lens, it leads you to not recognize what's going on that is of value. Yeah, and I think it's it's worth underscoring uh, just how uh, how prophetic this was in a way, because like if anything, even though perhaps uh, American policy hasn't recognized it, uh, the American economy has just become so indebted to Taiwan. I mean, right now we're feeling that because of the impact of the supply chain problems. I mean, Taiwan makes a huge percentage of the world's semiconductors and, and computer chips. And right. a big part of the reason why uh, there are, you know, it's difficult to get uh, appliances and, and, and consumer electronics is, is because they've uh, been facing challenges getting them to us because of COVID, in spite of having uh, done so well uh, uh, in their own dealing with, with the pandemic. And I think part of the problem here is, is the way that China has been putting pressure on them and making it hard for them to um, keep their markets open. If, uh, is, that, is that accurate assessment, would you say? Well, the, the, it's a little more complicated economically uh, because while the, the high-end semiconductors are absolutely made uh, in Taiwan, your second-tier semiconductors are all made by Taiwanese companies, but they're made in mainland China, um, as are all your iPhones. Uh, they're assembled by Taiwan companies, but they're assembled in mainland China because in many ways uh, the, the engine of a lot of those mainland factories are, are Taiwan companies. A lot of other foreigners too, but uh, Taiwan got the got the jump in there. Um, the PRC is actually is attempting to undermine that market because they are trying to transition part of that market to the PRC. Uh, one, because they want the economic growth out of it. Uh, two, because they fear they won't have the access uh, to those chips that they need in order to make other advances. Uh, for example, um, there's certain high end components that are either made in Taiwan or made in the United States that uh, Huawei needs to put in their equipment that is currently being used to steal 5G from the world that they can't do without United States and Taiwan technology. So when some of those exports were cut off, they freaked uh, and started becoming to the U.S. as a supplicant because, oh, please, please, please let us have those chips because they, they actually need them. So they're, they're, the PRC is interfering in that market to try to transition it to the mainland. Um, but it gets very uh, messy there with what the raw materials, that's part of the issue with the chips too, raw materials, um, the shipping, and then the whole supply chain disruption from uh, COVID that directly affects that and ancillarily affects that as well. So it, it's, uh, it is quite complicated. <laughs> We mentioned a few times now this essay by Ayn Rand, The Shanghai Gesture. It's a lengthy three-part article that she wrote uh, back between March and April of 1972, which is available exclusively in the Ayn Rand letter. This is a, this is a, a bound periodical that you can find, I think, on Amazon and I think on the ARI website. If you enjoyed watching New Ideal Live today, please be sure to like this episode, share it. Since you're watching a recording, it really helps if you leave a comment with your thoughts on the episode. This helps optimize the algorithm so that more people will uh, be able to follow us. Same thing if you are watching on Facebook. Uh, and as always, if you have questions about anything that came up today, uh, which I could perhaps relay to Scott and he might be able to answer them for us, consider sending us an email at newideal at einrand.org. Uh, we read all the emails that come in, we answer most of them, and sometimes we do uh, shows on topics that have been suggested by uh, the audience. So, uh, Scott, thanks again uh, for joining us, uh, and uh, really glad that we could have you on, and I hope that uh, people have uh, taken from what you've said a, a new perspective, that there's a, there's a philosophic perspective here uh, even on uh, questions in geopolitics that we see in the headlines that they might not have considered before. 
Thanks, Ben. Uh, I had a great time. And, uh, you know, when I used to introduce philosophy to my uh, military students, uh, I always would tell them, you know, why do you need this uh, philosophy? Well, as Ayn Rand told the West Point class of 1974, to solve concrete real world problems. This philosophy is a useful thing. So uh, hopefully your audience gets some use out of this. Uh, I know I did. I had a great time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Scott.